All right. Shalom and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this week's Torah portion teaching for Parshas Teruma. Now, before we get started, I wanted to let you guys know, we also have um, t audio only topical teachings over on our website, guitarrabbi.com, which uh, you can get the link to that that is streaming right below over here. And so, and you can also connect to it. Uh, the name of the podcast is Baruch B'Shem Yeshua, and you can connect to it um, through Apple Podcasts as well. So make a point to go and check that out. Okay. We're using EV mugs here and I am getting used to the interface with my slides and all that stuff. My slides are all out of order. <laughs> and so I'm having to look at the order on my phone while I bring them up on here. I, I did a goofy thing. I ended up going and doing an import all of all my slides, and so now they're out of order. <laughs> and, you know, with new platforms, you uh, learn to, um, well, you learn the right way to do things. <laughs> all right, so make a point to go and subscribe to our audio-only pod podcast. I got a very interesting episode on that that will be coming out tomorrow. These video teachings are uh, ones that are separate from the audio. And uh, so, you know, don't think that they are interchangeable. They're two totally different things. All right. But let's go ahead and get started in prayer as we get into this week's Torah Parsha. All right. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaLam Asher Kiddishanu Mitzatah Vitzivanu La'aso B'tavrei L'Torah Blessed are you, Hashem, our God, Master of the universe, who has sanctified us in the words of your Torah. I guess, Father, that you be with each and every single one of us today as we go through this week's Parshas, which is Parshas Teruma. Help us to be your Bayis Mikdash, your Mishkan, Father. Help us to have your holy presence, your Holy Spirit, dwell within us and help us this week to learn what that means and how to open ourselves up to your ways. We ask these things and pray these things in Yeshua's holy name. Amen. Okay, so... Um, my slides, I didn't, I, I was having a hard time getting the Hebrew in there, so we're not going to be reading from the Hebrew, because I'm going to have that right there in front of me. So I apologize that usually we do that, and I am going to get all this stuff fixed here very soon. Let's go to our first slide. Our first slide says, God spoke to Moshe Rabbeinu saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and have them dedicate to me a contribution. Take my offering from every person whose heart inspires him to generosity. Now, the thing that we're going to be getting into here, into here is the concept of, of Zedekah. The concept of Zedekah is a concept that has within it the word Sadik. Okay? The word Sadik is a righteous one. Okay? You constantly hear um, in rabbinic Texas that, that at any given point, there are 32 Sadikim living in the world at any given point. That's incredible. Doesn't seem like many, but man, that actually is a lot. When we look at the concept of righteousness and the word Zedekha, is the word for charity. And so one of the things that we're going to be getting in there is that there's a right way to do charity, there's a wrong way to do charity, and there's a way in which it is that some people are pushed into charity. The thing that we saw, saw from this verse is that, first of all, 
we see that God told Moshe Rabbeinu to go to speak to the children of Israel. And usually he has this whole thing of, okay, so many from the tribe of Issachar, so many from the tribe of Judah, so many from the tribe of Benjamin, so many from the tribe of Zebulun, you know, and so on. Go and do this. That's something that we always see. They say, go and do this. This is the one time in the Torah that this does not happen. It doesn't happen here. And that's really interesting. And this concept comes down to anything that it is that we do, anything that it is that we touch, any place and where it is that we go. We put a part of ourselves into that. Many years ago, I stopped watching horror movies. I used to love horribly bad B-horror movies. I love that garbage. And the thing is, I ended up stopping totally watching those movies. Why is that? Because even though there isn't anything necessarily evil about the directors, the writers, the actors, the people involved in it, there is still a spiritual attachment to those things of the emotion of fear. And the emotion of fear is not something that uh, the believer should have. You know, the emotion of fear is... A concept that the Satan tries to give you. So when you're watching these movies or you're listening to music with like bad language in it, it is attaching itself to the walls of your home. Okay? You have probably been in a place before that was probably absolutely beautiful. Great place. You know, has all the bells and whistles. And but you walk in there and you're like, something just doesn't feel right. And the reason for that is because of the fact that there is always a spiritual attachment. Juan says, no guitar today. Not today. Today's Torah portion day. You know, so we do the Torah portion things over here every single week. And so we're going to be getting into this concept here. In Likotei Halachot, Likotei Halachot is from Rabbi Nachman of Breslev. He says the contribution should be for God, not for self-aggrandizement. This is the concept of Lishma. The concept of Lishma is found all throughout that of not only Tarashe Biape, but also it is found in Bretadasha in the New Testament. We see Yeshua going and talking to his followers, talking to the disciples, and he's, all these people are wanting to be very lofty. They're like, you know what? I want to be his right-hand man. I want to be second in line. I want to be, you know. And the thing is that there's a core concept of humility that has to be involved. And Yeshua goes and says to his disciples, he says, those of you who want to be first in the Elom Haba, into the kingdom of heaven, you have to put yourself last. And he, he talks greatly about this, this attribute of servitude, about this attribute of servitude and the attribute not just being a physical act, but it's something that should encapsulate a person. It should be something that is within them, doing it for the reason of Lishma Hashem as opposed to regular lishma. What does lishma mean? Lishma means for the sake of. There are so many times that, we're, that we sit there and say to ourselves, you know what, if I get a loftier position in this ministry or that ministry or in my job or something like that, it's going to be good for me. The thing is that whenever it is that we receive humility and we start to walk and live in the humility that God wants us to walk in, then we are doing things lishma Hashem for the sake of God as opposed to for the sake of self. And so what happens is he then elevates us to where it is that he wants us to be. And we have a loftier place, possibly in the Alam Haba, but God, um, you know, and many times it's so easy 
to do it in today's world for regular lishma, for the sake of self. Because a person can go and start a 501c3, they can go and give themselves ordinations through a 501c3 and stuff like that without having to do the hard work, without having to learn the humility, without having to realize, you know what? I don't really have it all figured out. I don't really know it all. When we get to that point, that's when it is that we are starting to move Lishma Hashem. So the contribution to God should never be for our own glorification, for ourself, for any of those things. But we got a little bit more from Rebbe Nachman of Breslev, this time from Likote Maharon. And he says within here, it says, Rebbe Nachman explains in the passage below that when one's heart uh, oh, that when one opens his heart to charity and kindness he enables his open heart to receive greater blessing on high from the supernal heart he says in order to be charitable charitable blah, 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 a person must open his heart once his heart is open to give to others it can receive blessing and bounty from the supernal heart of the Noam Ha Elyon, the divine pleasantness. And so when Hashem says, you know what? I'm not going to say that I want so many from this purse, from uh, so many from this tribe or that tribe to go and build these things. Though who, who those who want to do it that is within them, yeah, I want to do this. They're putting a piece of themselves into the building of the Mishkan. And so within the building of the Mishkan, it is done Lishma Hashem. All of the tapestries that are in there, the walls, the doors, everything in there is done for the reason of Lishma Hashem, which is the ultimate holiness. It's the ultimate level of holiness to do it for the sake of Hashem as opposed to the for the sake of self. It's total and complete selflessness to do things in this manner. And so that's how it is that we need to go forward in anything that we do, not just in ministry, but in every aspect of our life. And we're going to get into a very important aspect of life with the next verse we're going to be looking at in this Torah portion. Okay, and I got a little bit of a graphic here as well. And this is from Shamos or Exodus chapter 25, verses 18 through 20, reading again from the Gotnik Chomish. It says that you shall make two golden cherub, each with the face of a child. Make them from, um, from the same piece of metal hammered out of the two ends of the lid. Make one cherub from one end and one cherub from the other end. Make one of the cherubs at each of the two ends of the lid of the same piece of metal. The cherubs should have their wings spread upwards, sheltering the lid with their wings, their faces toward one another. That's important. The faces of the cherub should be turned towards the lid. Now, it's very interesting how these concepts tie in to a verse that we're going to find later on in the scripture, near the end of the Old Testament. Because we read in 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 13, it said, and this is reading from the New American Standard Version, the wings of these cherubim, of these cherubim extended 20 cubits. They stood on their feet facing the main hall. Now, that's very interesting because if they are both facing the hall, there's a problem here because in the previous verse, it tells us right there 
that they should be facing one another. So is there a problem that we see in 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 13? Is Did somebody make a mistake? Is that what happened? Or is there something else going on here? The answer to this comes from the Talmud. And within tractate Bava Batra 99a, it says, How did they stand? Rabbi Jonan and Rabbi Eliezer are in dispute on this matter. As always, we always tend to be in dispute. You get two Jews, you always get three opinions. One says they faced each other. The other says their faces were inward. But according to him, who says that they faced each other, it may be asked, is it not written that their faces were inward? This is no difficulty. Now, now, now it's interesting because it says, is it not written their faces are inward, referring to Second Chronicles? That's very interesting. Many people will say, well, you know, only if it says it, it is written, it's always only the Torah. No, no, it's, it's the totality of Scripture. Even when quoting Brett Tadashar of the New Testament, it is written when you read the words of the Messiah. Okay, I just wanted to go and make that note. This is no difficulty. The former was at the time when Israel obeyed the will of the Omnipotent. The latter was at a time when Israel did not obey the will of the Omnipotent. According to him, who says that their faces were inward, it may be asked, is it not written that their face that they faced one to another and they were slightly turned sideways? For so it was taught, Onkelos, the proselyte, said, the cherubim were the image work and their faces were turned sideways as a student who takes a leave to his master. Meaning that when the people of God turn their back upon that of Hashem, then the two cherubim, which we read about in other places in the Torah, which is very interesting, or, in, or within Torah Shebe the oral Torah, the thing that is very interesting is that it says within, actually it's within the Zohar, it says that one of the cherub was a boy, the other one was a girl, and they were looking lovingly into each other's eyes, like a man and wife. And what ends up happening is that at some point, one did not want to look in the eyes of the other. It was the children of Israel who did not want to look into the eyes of Hashem, for they were ashamed, and they turned their back to Hashem. Now that turning of a back is not just because of their shame, but also because of the fact they chose to also turn their back upon the ways of Hashem. The thing that we have to realize is that during the times of Second Chronicles, as well as the prophets, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, all those, all those books of the Tanakh, the thing that we constantly see happening are the people turning their backs upon that of Hashem. And the prophet, Jeremiah, Yecheskel, Ezekiel, they had to bring the people back to that of Hashem. We have the minor prophets that do the same thing, such as Jonah, such as Hezekiah, and several others that we can mention. This is a constant. But the thing that's interesting about all of this is the concept of shalom that is conveyed through the two cherubim looking lovingly into each other's eyes when things were good between the children of Israel and Hashem. And then when things went bad, one turned its back on the other. 
this right here gets to where it is that observance of the Torah starts. It starts in the home. Notice we always end up saying our Shabbos. Good Shabbos or Shabbat Shalom. We always end up saying that. And the reason why it is that we do that is that because of the fact that we're trying to manifest shalom through that of the Shabbos, but we have to have that inner shalom. That's why there's this concept of shalom bais that comes before the Shabbat shalom happens. There is the shalom bais that comes from Erev Shabbos. And this is a concept that the Rabbi Shalom Arush talks at great length about in his book, Gan Idan, or, or, or Gar Gan Shalom, The Garden of Peace, a marital guide for men. He says in there that it's a woman's job to bring the shalom to the home. It's the man's job to learn how to keep it. How does he do this? He does it through his humility, through a giving of himself to that of his wife. That is how he does this. He gives of himself to his wife. And this puts into context many things that Paul says in Brit Hadashah. Because many will go and read it outside of a first century Hashkatha, halfway across the world, and they'll say, well, the man's supposed to be like Jackie Gleason, king of the castle, lord of the manor. That's not the concept that the people in which it is that Paul was writing to at the time in which he was writing to. This is not what it is that they understood. He's using that hashkafa to show this concept of shalom bayis. I'll tell you, in terms of feminism, there's good kinds of feminism and there's the wacky kind that we have today. The good kind and the true kind of feminism is something that is within that of Judaism. For the shalom that is within the home, again, the wife brings it. She brings that shalom. That shalom that is within, this basically her house. Honestly, it really is. And it's a very empowering thing because we learn from Chazel that women are on a higher mindrega, on a higher spiritual level than us men are. That's, in, you know, and th that's not something that is taught today. That is not taught in the churches today or anything else, you know, it's still that, you know, Jackie Gleason, or Jackie Gleason, king of the castle, lord of the manor kind of thing that is taught today. But biblically, it doesn't hold up, and Remy Nachman of Breslev gets into this. Okay? He says, in Lekote Mahoron, he says, peace in the home depends entirely on the husband. When a husband is modest, and guards his personal holiness, he shines 224 uh, spiritual lights upon his wife. 224 being the numerical value of the word derech, the word for way, which she then in turn reflects back to him. His wife will be happy and will support him in all he does. This is another meaning of the verse in Exodus regarding the cherubs and their faces were towards one another. That is, the husband illuminates his wife and she shines his light back on him. Now, one of the things that it says within the Zohar is that it says that a man is the sun and the wife is the moon. For she doesn't have any light of her own. She reflects back what it is that she receives from that of her husband. Okay? And this is something that us men have a hard time understanding in the 21st century. The thing is that we see women as being another dude. <laughs> we can go and criticize and say, you know, uh, you know, this is what you're doing. One, one of the things that Rabbi Shalom Arush had written in God Shalom is never under any circumstance will, should a man ever criticize his wife. Under no circumstance whatsoever 
Why? Because she thinks differently than we do. She's a lot different than us. We operate on two different... Uh, so, man, we're very analytical. We're very, you know, okay, this part goes here. You know, we're putting stuff together and all that stuff. It's like, okay, well, the, the, the chair is built. Or the motor is put back together. You know, women, however... They think on a higher mandraga, a much more spiritual mandraga than us men do. They really do. And we try and see things as interchangeable, and they're not. we got to realize that there is definitely a difference between men and between, uh, between, um, between men and between women. And so... We got some more slides here. And we're going to go to uh, Brit Hadashah in 1st Kepha. And it says in there, so now we understand how it is that these things are supposed to be understood. When we read this verse, and it says, And you husbands thus dwell with your wives in understanding... And as much unto a weaker vessel, holding them in honor, because they also with you are inheriting the gift of life, which is unto forever, so that you not be hindered in your prayers. Now, there's something that we must understand with this. As we go forward with this concept, there are two stories that are found within the Talmud, and we'll read them both. One of the first ones says, Two brothers lived on two sides of the mountain. One was rich with no children. The other had many children and was very poor. The rich brother thought, I have so much, my brother has so little. Let me secretly call, cross the mountain in the middle of the night and bring my brother extra crop. The poor brother said, I derive so much happiness from my children. Let me secretly bring my brother some of my crop so that he could have a little extra joy in this world. And so it went each night. And every night, each of the brothers secretly crossed the mountain to bring the other brother food. Every morning, the brothers would inspect their stock and learn nothing was missing. Neither could they explain the phenomena, but they thanked God for his kindness and contributed in their goodwill. After years of this routine, a schedule uh, change occurred. Instead of two brothers missing each other in the night, there on top of the mountain the two brothers met. They looked at each other in surprise, and they simultaneously realized what they had been, uh, what had been happening all the years. They both spontaneously embraced one another there on the top of the mountain as they cry for joy, and the two brothers. Uh, uh, and and these two brothers were we do not uh, where we do not know, but it was the mountaintop, says the Medrash, that God decided the Brit Hadashah, the holy temple, should be built. And we got another story as well, very similar. And it, see how it all comes back. It all goes and um, circles one another. There is a man who made a party. He instructed his servants to invite the friend Kamsa. His servants erred and invited the enemy of, of Bar Katzma. Apparently, Katzma's son, when Bar Katzma arrived at the party, the host was furious. He instructed his servants to oust him. Bar Katzma, being very embarrassed, pleaded with the host to allow him to stay and even offered to pay for his meal. The host did not hear it. Bar Katzma must leave. The guest begged him not to create a scene and offered to pay for half of the whole party. No way. He upped his proposition and offered to finance the extra piece of the party, but the host was still adamant. Bar Katzma was totally humiliated. He looked around, saw the room full of friends at the head table where all the rabbis, no one said a thing. The party went on. Bar Katzma was so deplored that he went 
to the government authorities to complain about the Jews. No, uh, one thing led to another, and Jerusalem was destroyed. So the thing that we learned here is that these are two stories of two radically different things. They are in opposition to one another. They are the antithesis of one another. And two totally different results. Two totally different results. And it all comes back to the premise of Shalom Ba'is and the premise as well of the Ba'is Hak Mikdash. Okay, so we are going to continue on here into um, another verse from Brit Hadashah. And this is something that is a very well-known verse from 1 Corinthians 3.16. Do you not know that you are the temple of God? And the Spirit of God dwells within you. This entire concept of the holiness of Hashem is something that is that is something that is internal. It's something that is internal. And then it penetrates out from within ourselves to the walls of the home, which is to serve as a Ba'is Hag Mikdash in today's day and age when there is not a Ba'is Hag Mikdash. It is not the shul. It is not the synagogue. It is the home. And this is something that we read a great deal about in Shulchan Oric. And the thing is that we see another verse from Brit Tadashah within that of the uh, of the um, well, let's see if I can find it here. Okay. In the Besorot, in Yohanan, or John chapter 2, verse 19. It says, Yeshua answered and said unto them, Destroy the temple, and after three days I will rise it up. This brings us all the way back to the very first verse that we looked at about the reason for Lishma Hashem. Everything that it is that we do, we do for the reason of Lishma Hashem. For the sake of Hashem, as opposed to for the sake of self. So there you have it. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank all of you for joining me here today. Make sure to go and check out our audio podcast. We got a brand new episode of that that is separate from the video Torah portion teachings um, that is right over there at guitarrabbi.com. Make sure to go and check that, all, check that out. And I want to wish all of you Shalom Bracha peace and a blessing. Thank you so much for joining us. Shalom.